ours was a grand, imposing family home, built around a courtyard and surrounded by stately wrought iron gates. As children, my elder sister, by twelve months, Jocelyn, and I were never quite sure if those gates were intended to keep the world out or us within. Despite its many south-facing windows, the sun never seemed to penetrate the richly furnished interior. It was a cold house, cold on every level. The rooms were cold, father was colder, mother colder still, at least towards Jojo and I. They much preferred our four elder brothers who were to follow in the family's military footsteps. We girls were, on the other hand, treated like a sorrow that needed to be borne, and for reasons never adequately explained. But at the very least, we had each other for comfort. I don't know quite when I began to develop what I have come to refer to as my sixth sense. I must have been quite young. I have a childhood memory of playing hide-and-seek with Joe and, whilst I hid in the attic, of touching a dusty glass decanter and experiencing what could only be described as a vision of its former usage and the startling conviction that said decanter was the vessel used to poison some poor unfortunate. I told no one, not even my beloved Jojo. I was already considered an oddity by my wider family and did not intend to lose her confidence into the bargain. And so we grew into our teens, I with my secret and she with her kind and trusting nature. It is perhaps not surprising that having grown up in a house so devoid of male affection, that Jocelyn, who had by now grown into a very beautiful young woman, fell for the first gentleman who was to show her any real attention. Captain Toby Fleming was an army friend of our eldest brother, Magnus, and was invited to our home on a break from their military manoeuvres in the summer of Jocelyn's 18th year. He was undeniably handsome and entertaining in a brash, vulgar sort of way, but despite avoiding all physical contact, my sixth sense alerted me to his dubious character. Not so dear Jocelyn, whose favours he pursued relentlessly. Upon his return to his regiment, they began to correspond voluminously, though she declined to share the contents of her communication. Indeed, she seemed to withdraw from me and retreat ever deeper inside herself. I admit I found this deeply troubling, as I had always been her trusted confidant. The last time I saw her alive was when she awoke in the middle of the night, dressed for flight. She hurriedly explained that with war imminent in South Africa and the captain's regiment being notified that they were to be deployed there, he had decided to abscond rather than be forced to separate, and they were to elope to London forthwith. She begged me to keep her counsel and promised to write as soon as they were settled. But no word ever came. Amongst the more than 120,000 British and Imperial casualties of the Second Boer War, all four of my brothers perished. I was left to nurse my parents through their grief. However, being already aged and unwell, they died within weeks of each other, broken-hearted, and I was left the sole heiress to the family fortune in the absence of Jocelyn, for my sixth sense told me she would never return alive. My concern now was to find out what had happened to her, since we had learnt some time before that Toby Fleming had been shot as a deserter. After a respectable period of mourning and with funds newly available to me, I thus engaged the services of a consulting detective, the illustrious Jack Hibbard, in the hope of finding trace of my dear beloved sister. And so, as a result of his investigations, I find myself in the shelter of the crumbling though still functioning church of St Cecilia in London's East End, and the 
graveyard that lay forlorn. It was a cold winter's afternoon, the third week in December, as I took shelter just inside the parish church vestibule, looking out over the desolate phalanx of headstones which poked and prodded this way and that out of the frozen earth. The very Reverend Nathaniel Throssell stood alongside me, wearing a glum fixity of expression, like a miser who had seen no change from a farthing. He was small in stature, no more than five feet tall, but what he lacked in height he more than made up for in width. Mutton chop whiskers embraced the sagging uniformity of his cheeks. He glanced up at me from under heavy lidded eyes and folded his hands before him. My hair was tucked neatly away under a decorative bonnet, which was tied with ribbon under my chin. I wore a handsome layered cape over a pale silk dress, buttoned high at the neck, which was as flattering as it was impractical in the inclement weather. With wide skirts below the narrow waist, and I tottered on the heels of my pigskin calf-length boots. Impractical clothing was, I knew, a sign of high status and had had the desired effect of causing the Reverend to be especially deferential and obsequious in his dealings with me. The Reverend's deep, resonant voice spoke quietly. Your sister, you say? I blinked back tears and stared down at him solemnly. My elder sister Jocelyn, I replied. Jocelyn Merchant, but latterly known as Mrs Jocelyn Fleming. The Reverend brought his hand to his cheek and twirled his whiskers with his ink-stained thumb and forefinger. I am sorry for your loss, he said, and cleared his throat. <clears throat> but I have no recollection of the name and cannot find any reference in the parish records. But the private investigator I engaged said, I pleaded softly, like a kitten mewing at an empty saucer of milk, couldn't you check again one last time? The Reverend shook his head sadly, for I knew it pained him that he might well be losing out on a generous donation to the relief fund set up to pay for the repairs to the lead roof above our heads. He spread his hands. Alas, if your sister was an unfortunate woman, as you suggest, in all likelihood she was buried under an assumed name, in unconsecrated ground, with no marker. I only took up my position six or seven months ago, and have no knowledge. Taking a lace handkerchief from my sleeve, I brought it to my face as bereft. I turned and hastened down the church path, out through the open gates and into the street. Beyond the church boundaries, life carried on regardless, whilst within it all hope had been snuffed out. I hurriedly crossed the cobbles, darting deftly to avoid traffic, and gasping slightly, I scurried up the set of stone steps in front of me. Entering Mrs Aitken's hostelry for young gentlewomen, and closing the front door behind me, I pressed my back up against it momentarily, my eyes taking in the empty vestibule, before gathering up my skirts and darting up the hall stairs to the welcome refuge of my rented room. I locked the door behind me, wrenched the bonnet from my head, the cloak from my shoulders, and hurling them aside with no concern as to where they came to rest, I fell forward onto the bed, burying my head in the pillow in an attempt to stifle my sobs. In this position I cried myself to sleep. I had paid for the rooms a week in advance with no idea why or how long I might stay. All I did know was that the rooms afforded me an unobstructed view of the graveyard. The room cost three shillings a week with cooking, half a crown without. My meals being delivered to my door by the housemaid, Ida. The proprietor of the rented rooms, Mrs Luella Aitkin, lived on site and worked directly for the tenants, giving her lodgings a greater air of respectability. It was to be reflected both in class terms as well as in the weekly rent. Mrs Aitkin was a somewhat stiff and severe personage, interested in her lodger's business only in so much as it might impact on her own pocket and reputation. She let her lodgings to superior clientele, or so she liked to claim. She wished for nothing more from them than prompt payment 
and what they required to eat. Her presence as a live-in landlady meant not only that her establishment was higher up the social scale, but also that she was on hand to monitor the behaviour of her residents, albeit silently but stealthily, and was often to be found lurking in the shadows. I was roused some time later by the tapping at my door, and unlocked it to find Ida with my evening meal of steamed fish and vegetables between two plates. Lighting a candle to dissipate the gloom, I seated myself to dine at the commodious desk table. It occupied the curved niche formed by the bay window, the front pane of which looked directly out upon the graveyard, but was, on this occasion, obscured by my reflection on the glass. Having little appetite, I barely picked at my food as, once again, I read through the contents of the report I'd received from my consulting detective. In short, he had discovered that Jojo and her captain had taken lodgings in one of the more reputable enclaves within the Spitalfields district and he had found work in the offices of a boot factory close to where they made their home for the six months or so before tragedy struck. Whilst out on a Sunday afternoon stroll, the captain was spotted by a former comrade stationed at Wellington Barracks. There can have been no love lost, as he was reported to the authorities, arrested as a deserter, court-martialed, and put before a firing squad as a warning to all. Jocelyn, who was by this time heavily pregnant, had thereafter been turned out of her lodgings and had effectively disappeared. The last unconfirmed report was from a nefarious source who claimed a young woman matching her description had been buried at St Cecilia's, but could not or would not provide further detail. No record of the child had ever been reported. When Ida came to collect my plate, she gave me a look of concern. She wasn't in the habit of speaking much, but her eyes were exceedingly eloquent. Did you not enjoy your meal, miss? she asked. I shook my head. No, I just don't feel very hungry tonight. I could bring you something else, if you'd like. No, don't trouble yourself, Ida. Really, I'm just not hungry. Well, if you're sure, miss, shall I close the curtains? No, thank you. I prefer them open and there is no one to overlook us. She took the plate and cutlery without another word and gently closed the door behind her upon her exit. She was a pretty young thing and, although exceedingly timid, had impressed me with her attentive nature. I occupied myself then in writing a letter to Mr Hibbard, my consulting detective, detailing my fruitless inquiries of that day and requesting a further appointment before sharing my darker fears and concerns with my diary. Then I read a while, before simply sitting and staring at my mirrored reflection and beyond into the darkness, the candle burning away at my elbow. I was convinced Joe was out there, only a short distance from where I sat. Convinced, as only a sensitive can be. Utterly convinced. And if I was correct, if she were to be out there gazing up, I wanted her to have sight of me at my vigil. As the candle burnt itself out, my reflection disappeared and the empty cobbled street at St Cecilia's and its graveyard were thrown into relief by the yellow haze of a gas street lamp. Snow had just begun to fall and was leaving a dusting where it fell. And there, there amongst the tombstones, stood the figure of a woman nursing a small bundle and staring up at my window. The figure did not move, but continued to look up imploringly. Without hesitation, I shuffled on a heavy hooded cape and shoes, padded down the stairs, left the front door on the latch and exited into the still quiet night. 
Crossing the street, I found the church gates padlocked, barring my entry, and with the walls on either side too high to scale. I gripped the metal railings and shook them in frustration and to no avail. Then, leaning my forehead against them in defeat, I heard myself utter a feeble cry of Jocelyn. My sister appeared then, on the other side of the bars. She looked tired and drawn, devoid of all colour, but with a dull, white, luminous halo surrounding her. Drifting towards me, she reached out a cold, dead hand and covered one of mine as I continued to grip the metal rods. Dulcimer, you can see me. I can, dear sister. She appeared to shudder with relief. Then listen, there is precious little time and much to say. Go on. My Toby died, you know, I think. And I was with child. I was mad with grief. I thought of returning home, but for the shame. And so I took what savings we had left and took refuge across the road where you currently reside. Mrs. Aitken kept me hidden at the back of the house with the other unfortunates, having agreed to take care of me upon the understanding that, were I to have a son, I would give up my child for adoption at birth. For she has many rich and well-to-do clients and assured me it would be best for all concerned. But when Samuel was born, I could not bear to part with him. He was such a darling, and so like his dear father. And then I got sick. I'm buried just over there atop another's grave. Tears filled her eyes as mine matched hers. Find him, Dulcimer. Please find him for me and take him home. And tell him, tell him often his mother loved him with her very last breath. But I indicated the bundle she cradled in her arms. She let the blanket fall open and it was empty. It is small comfort to me, she said simply and turned to drift away. Looking back, she said only, Find him? Promise me you will find him? And as I made my solemn promise, she was gone. I returned swiftly to the house and, much to my alarm, found the door locked. I had no sooner rattled the doorknob than the door was opened and Ida stood on the other side. You really shouldn't have gone out, miss. It's not allowed. No one is to enter or exit after ten o'clock, Mrs. Aitken's orders. Why, if she was here, not visiting her sister overnight, I pushed past her, and she closed the door behind me and threw the bolts. As she turned back towards me, I asked her boldly, Tell me, Ida, what do you know of Mrs. Aitken's adoption service? She blanched. No, I... I reached out and took her hand, and in the instance I knew, she knew exactly to what I was referring. I knew also of the heavy weight she herself was carrying. It took some persuasion, but eventually Ida led me to the locked bureau in Mrs Aitken's parlour, where, I was assured, she kept all her papers of that sort, and was handed the key that Ida had fortuitously found whilst dusting. It took some considerable searching, but finally I found what I was looking for. I copied all the salient details onto a handy piece of notepaper and putting all documents back as found, I relocked the bureau and handed the key back to Ida. It was then she asked querulously if I was lucky enough to find my nephew, would I come back and help her find her little Georgie? I owe an inestimable debt of gratitude to Mr Hibbard for it is he who was successful in tracking down little Sammy and returning him into my care. 
Ida was to be similarly fortunate. It was not easy to reclaim the children from their adopted families, but the combined threat of litigation and public exposure eventually proved sufficient, and the four of us returned to my ancestral home as quite the little family. The ensuing scandal ruined Mrs Aitken's reputation, and once my sister's body was exhumed and an autopsy performed, saw her convicted of murder and hung for arsenic poisoning. I did not attend the trial, but am told her conviction was inevitable once they found the decanter in the bottom drawer of her bureau, with the dried traces of arsenic still in it, and I was reminded of the one I had stumbled upon in the attic so very long ago, but which is now nowhere to be found.